So, um, uh, in dialogue with Sam, I, I thought I was going to do something that uh, addressed his sphere of interest in the full-scale mock-ups. But as I started to read the questions more closely, I realized that there's a probably a larger discussion that could happen here between what we do as students and what we do as professionals and to bring them around two spheres of discussion. The first being around the act of drawing and uh, the problems of representation, which will be the first half of this introduction. And then the second one is three case studies, which are you know, buildings with bona fide complexities on which I will actually only concentrate on the mock-ups as a way of uh, linking what I hope will be uh, some of Sam's preoccupations with a, a kind of uh, commercial break in the middle to talk about the, draw, the uh, analysis drawings. It, it'll take a little bit of time for me to read the statement about that, but hopefully, uh, Sam, you let me get away with that extra two minutes. Um, when we were students, and as we were trying to launch our practices, uh, we had no clients, uh, we had no agency, uh, and the model became a kind of surrogate form through which we could make uh, a reality out there convincing. Uh, and so, with the construction of models that are at half-inch scale, that produce models the size of this table, we were able to induce the odor of reality without ever having to build a building. And if you look at corrugated cardboard and its structural behavior, uh, you understand that it works very much like corrugated metal. So there's no difference. And in doing the Weston House, we realized that um, the corrugation was already a demonstration of the theorem of a ruled surface, in that the top of that corrugation and the bottom are the same length. And therefore, it was structurally rigid on one axis and malleable on the other, enabling this thin skin to become spatial at the moment of conjunction of the stair where the garden connects with the living room. What I liked about this discovery was not so much just the, the undulation of the skin, but the idea that drawing in architecture is not pictorial in the first instance, uh, it is already constructive. You construct a drawing and the, the drawing is a, is a demonstration and evidence of its buildability. At around a similar time, we were working on a project in Venezuela and I wanted to understand better what is it that Venezuela brings to the equation that is not part of our own personal agency, but rather has something to do with, that comes from within the culture, something salient within its, its construction logics. And we went to what would there be their uh, Home Depot and discovered terracotta tiles, uh, blocks, and bricks, and realized that the entire city is made up of these things except they are covered up by stucco and stone. We asked ourselves a simple question, what would it mean to build out of that medium? And in doing so, we came across uh, the idea that bricks and blocks are not so much gauged by the dimension of their units, their units but rather they're gauged by the tolerances that you bring to the ordering of their bonding systems. And so what you're looking at here is what we call the variable bond because we're actually sliding between what you would normatively call a, a normative bond and a uh, Flemish bond to create variable openings that bring the advent of light and air into a structurally active surface. Again, a model. Uh, and here we're making a bridge between the act of drawing uh, and the act of construction. And this is all chronological in a way. Uh, we are still, in my mind, students trying to come to grips with a discipline uh, and a profession that uh, eludes and evades us. Uh, but in being asked to do a, 
an installation, a full-scale fabrication, a mock-up for the Museum of Modern Art, one of four installations some 20 years ago, actually exactly 20 years ago, um, we were interested, without drawings, without models, without the, 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 the paraphernalia that architectural exhibitions come in, we were interested in doing something that explicitly uh, bridges the gap between the practices, the pictorial practices of painting and the spatial practices of architecture. In doing so, we wanted to paint a flat canvas that is made up of some 40, 50 panels, all identical in dimension, perfectly right, perfectly plumb, perfectly level, but that would somehow insinuate some variation as you look at it frontally. Now, of course, all of this is a, an optical ruse that is uh, unleashed by the prospect of uh, perspectival games uh, in which the optics is actually in the service of a different way of building altogether. And in those early digital days where everybody was interested in uh, visualization, we were more interested in how digital fabrication came to change the way that you would do plans and sections and those kinds of working drawings that we have to do. And in fact, these flattened drawings are the vehicle by which we did the construction drawings. And the stitched seam that you see on the right is an offset score that allows for the continuity of material as you rotate around to gain a tolerance of less than a quarter of an inch over 50 feet to create something that is quite complex, both spatially and formally. In coming to Cooper Union, uh, in part uh, uh, due to the analysis exhibit that was here the year before I arrived, uh, in also great part looking and witnessing uh, the faculty uh, in the trenches of the analysis studio, I was uh, completely intoxicated by um, the prospect of drawing again and the conceptual act of architecture and how drawing and analysis outside of the advent of materiality on which I had been so focused would come to rekindle our imaginations. Um, this drawing was done uh, after I returned from Rome last year around this time and if you don't mind I'm going to read here because it's, it's just simpler and it's a way uh, for you to uh, get into the mind frame that uh, I was interested in. St. Peter's inverted crucific crucifixion, down to earth looking up to the heavens. The altar of the Tempieto located on axis with the entry into the courtyard of San Pietro in Montorio appears to be composed of a monolithic of monolithic pieces of marble. It is distinct from the conventional altar conceived as a freestanding piece of furniture. Encrypted into the logic of the building's architecture, the, architect, the altar is set against the outer wall, further thickening the mass of the load-bearing structure. Consistent with Robin Evans's article, Perturbed Circles, in the projective cast, the position of the altar contributes to the effect of multiple centers achieved in this building and its decentering underlines the importance of this choice. Indeed, the altar is not only not monolithic, uh, but the inverse. It is composed of a series of thin marble slabs behind which a cavity allows for a clerestory window into the crypt. The altar serves as the window's frame, and thus the two are absolutely codependent. If it's not clear what I'm referring to, uh, it is uh, uh, it is this moment right here. So the drawing starts right at this critical moment and then expands up and down uh, from, uh, from that moment on. So uh, bear with me one second. As partial as it may seem, the sectional detail of this altar reveals something about this building 
that not only subverts the conventions of its time, but also requires a form of representation beyond the normative techniques of drawing. Due to its curious spatial reciprocity, the figure-ground relationship between the space of the Clare story underneath and the form of the altar above is so tight that the building is exempted from the poche character characteristic of the structures of this period. If the mass of the traditional wall is meant to provide structural support for a building, it's also the means by which ancillary spaces such as niches and other figural voids can be carved out. The tempietto does away with this mass altogether, it is exempt from it, ingeniously conjoining the two functions by using one as the alibi for the other. The altar gives light and the Clare story offers mass. This telltale detail of the tempietto also exposes the difficulty of drawing complex circumstances that require simultaneously looking up and down, if only to show two facets of something inextric inextricably bound together. For this reason, the small structure, this small structure offers the ideal opportunity with which to advance a form of representation whose purpose is not to illustrate what is already known, but to expose the inner workings of something that can only be unearthed forensically. The drawing is the result of the flip-flop technique coined by Daniel Castor in his book Drawing Berlacher's Exchange, where he demonstrates how this drawing type produces a beguiling form of visual ambiguity that enables the eye to invert the perception of foreground and background. Not dissimilar to Elisitsky's abstract cabinet, Castor's isometric constructed from a trifold 120 degree angle of projection is distinct in its balance, biased towards the X, Y, and Z axes all at once. So the architectural application of this technique resides in the latent alignment between the conventional bird's eye view looking down and the worm's eye view looking up, the latter often attributed to Choisy. If the bird's eye view exposes the world of the roof, the worm's eye reveals the inner workings of the dome, effectively two different symbolic realms. Bramante conceived of both the Tempietto and St. Peter's Basilica a few years apart making their conceptual connection somehow inevitable. The Tempietto, a martyrium dedicated to St. Peter's, is a folly of sorts, at once a model, a mock-up, and a miniature building in its own right, with the gravitas of spatial, formal, and ling linguistic tropes that advance the discourse of its time. In its crypt underneath, you can see, a pit on center with, uh, with the oculus is purported to be the receptacle within which St. Peter's cross would have been planted upside down, looking up at the dome, as it were, in his last living moments. In light of the eventual dual shell construction technique adopted at St. Peter's Dome, one can understand the absolute necessity of looking up and down simultaneously, because the domes are not symbolically divided, but structurally semi-autonomous. By extension, even though the Tempietto, the tempietto is a single shell structure, the flip-flop technique in this drawing demonstrates the instrumentality of looking inside and out si simultaneously. Thank you for uh, uh, your patience on that. Um, now, the, the analysis drawing uh, is an extension of this, the idea that a, a drawing may serve many purposes, going from plan to axonometric, showing the importance in this case of the frontality of a large uh, front to the main street, the idea that a building may be subdivided into parts in the domestic side uh, in accordance with the neighborhood behind, and how the scale of that building uh, begins to serve its hydrological purposes, and how the massing of that may get redistributed in, a, in accordance with the ne necessary sunlight that it needs to gain in a deep matte building. It also brings together the possibility about how the internal grain of a building, in this case a library, has shelving that goes perpendicular to the actual grain of the structure of that building, which overlap in a kind of plaid uh, <coughs> ice cream sandwich, as it were, bringing you together in a cross-axial experience 
that is at once dedicated to the interior of the building, but also the exterior of the building, where you're saving key pieces of the natural heritage of the site. At the end of the day, the anomalies of this building have to do with the restoration of a tree, an existing oak tree that is on that site. And so this is as much about the toggling back and forth between one medium and the other. Now, as we go into the buildings, and I'll go very fast here, uh, I want to simply make a connection between the idea of construction as a research pro project in itself, uh, at once invested in the representation of how buildings read, but also the actuality of how they're built. And in this case, none of these are done in the advanced stages of a design, but rather as seminal parts of details that become in a way instrumental in developing these projects. In this case, how the end grain plywood construction of the millwork of this building are speaking in tandem with the uh, brick piers that run north-south that essentially uh, uh, not only envelop the, the structure but are the insides of that structure and uh, how the, the end grain supports not only structural but uh, programmatic elements including the railings and the guards that demonstrate the, 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 uh, the end grain on one axis to bring light to the northern elevation, but also uh, faces where uh, you want the solidity of the private rooms that are somehow concealed on the east and the west. Uh, similarly, at a completely different scale, uh, the east and west elevations uh, of the MIT project as they come to serve uh, a, a different scalar argument about the stacking of triple-deckers uh, to mediate between the, the scale of something that is read at the dimension of the skyline of Boston and Cambridge, all the while while creating these subtle folds and bends that protect it from the afternoon sun, using the coloration of uh, anodized aluminum to attenuate and extend the, the visual perception of this tower to make it look taller, going from dark bronze to, to light as it extends up the building, using the mock-ups as a way of gauging not only the color but the, the fineness and the precision of the detail such that one sees it at the scale of the, uh, of the skyline, at the scale of the block, and at the scale of human occupation uh, up close and this is an image of it just uh, three or four days ago in the afternoon sun. Uh, and finally, uh, a story that uh, many of you have already heard, but um, uh, our engagement with uh, uh, the University of Toronto in the renovation and expansion of Knox College for the Daniel School of Architecture to look at a very compact building uh, within which uh, the old building takes stock of all of the classrooms and the offices, uh, but the large studio spaces uh, occur to the north, giving it a new facade uh, to northern Spadina while using the landscape for additions and engagements with the urban sphere. Uh, this is very much a landscape project. Uh, and the roof participates uh, in this landscape and maybe the most complex of its construction in the sense that the undulations of the landscape of the roof are A, what's, what make it span, uh, B, bring natural daylighting uh, uh, into the space, C, uh, create radiant cooling above, uh, and four, uh, uh, enable the hydrology of the site to go down uh, the sides of the building uh, only to understand that this uh, was purportedly uh, to be unbuildable by the contractors, even though we knew it was buildable. Uh, it was through much of our agenda our, and, and our proactivity that we changed systems, actually. We went from a concrete to a steel system to demonstrate how uh, it's buildable, but also quite affordable, with the idea of the radiant panels going up overhead rather than under, bringing it down uh, eight hundred thousand dollars to make it affordable uh, and essentially demonstrate that there are flexibilities within systems albeit going from concrete to steel involves a thicker slab with the radiant panels 
And, and the idea that, uh, you know, uh, at that moment in a project, one is effectively in warfare, and that the uh, mock-up is not only an academic tool, but rather a tool of warfare to be able to uh, bring such things to life. Sam. Thank you. Great. So, uh, thank you very much for including me in this experience. And um, yes, we have to change this. I also mentioned that uh, Professor Lorena Del Rio uh, was invited to be with us and hopes to join us. She had something come up, but she could walk in at any time. So she'll be part of it too. Um, so what I'm going to present is uh, somewhat more narrow than what Nadir was talking about. Let me just, uh, uh, but still to talk about uh, mock-ups, basically uh, both uh, as we've used them here in the building technology syllabus, uh, but also in design and in construction using mock-up as a method for helping to gauge and validate the choices that one's making uh, in both design and construction. Um, and to anticipate to some extent some of the questions uh, that were presented to us in terms of how to manage client expectations, I would say that's a sub-theme in this. So, um, so first in the architecture curriculum, uh, there are a number of uh, projects that have been built in the last several years that several of you will remember fondly. <laughs> and um, what we've discovered is that uh, students learn a variety of different things by doing these exercises. Um, in this particular case, which I believe was uh, not quite full scale, right? That's about it. Yeah, it was three quarters. Right, three quarter scale. Um, so uh, these students were able to put together something that had several different assemblies and it illustrated the cantilever and the marriage of steel and concrete in different ways um, and the influence of paint in a design. <clears throat> this is going a little bit further back. Uh, this was also a slightly reduced scale, the a module of the Tokyo housing project. Um, so these are cases where uh, it was almost full scale, and the idea was to get a real appreciation for how, the, how those materials go together, how different materials touch each other, and um, how to make those connections or allow for movement. Then also, uh, quite a few projects have been done uh, with a smaller scale, and that makes a lot of sense if you're trying to really understand what's the, what's the overall assembly, what, how does the structure actually work. So this is a case last year where, or this fall actually, where um, by doing it at a much smaller scale, the students were still able to analyze and appreciate the joints of how the different pieces go together, but how an entire truss would work and how it's uh, suspended in an interesting counterbalance way from the verticals. Uh, then going a little bit further back, this is another one of the really exciting ones. I'm glad to see these students here. So, and this is a, a building, <coughs> the Library of Mexico City, which is all about hanging. Um, the entire, uh, it's an inversion of the typical stacks of a library which are supported from below and hold up the roof. In this case, the roof uh, has a truss system that holds up all the stacks. And the students were able to uh, put together this to really illustrate that and to also look at questions of how to hang it from the columns, introduce the issue of friction. Then even at a much smaller scale, so this is a Candela building from the, the Mexico analysis semester. Um, where they didn't actually end up building the, uh, the concrete shell that goes on top of this, but just by building the formwork, it's an opportunity to really uh, examine and see how the rules surface approach can work and create magnificent and delightful shapes um, just using straight lines. So they built the formwork and the support structure. And then part of this has always been to also document the process and keep track of all the parts that go into both drawing and anticipating what's built uh, and documenting the actual process. <clears throat> and then another value is, uh, as an example here again from last fall, having uh, a mock-up which 
when positioned correctly in the, in the lobby, is able to illustrate the, um, the spatial and light effect of, of that design. So, uh, so I included these basically examples of a mock-up in the design curriculum as opportunities for students to appreciate um, how things go together, to get their hands dirty in terms of actually understanding a little bit more about concrete and other materials, steel. This is a, also an interesting case where they substituted the actual material, used a plaster instead of terracotta, but they were still able to learn a lot about how, how it went together. <clears throat> um, and then finally, teamwork. Um, one of the key things about these projects is that the students always work in teams, and uh, that's, I think, important for them to understand how to rely on each other, how to work together, how to make and keep promises. And that's certainly something that uh, happens in the construction world and in design and studios, uh, that people are working as teams. So now we're going to switch over and give some examples of mock-up. This first one is a mock-up in a construction process. So this is a fairly standard version of a mock-up. Uh, so here are a couple of pictures of a mason putting together a brick mock-up for uh, some people at Cloney Williamsburg who are fanatically into brickwork and uh, old-fashioned ways of doing things. So if you look closely, here's the tub with his mortar. Here he has his one tool that he's applying the mortar to the brick. You can see the little narrow string up there that's the only guide he has as to where to put it. And then the picture on the right, he's putting it in place. And then in the next two pictures, he's tamping it to get it just right. And he's using the trowel to scrape away the excess. And he'll stand there and do that a long time to build a mock-up that ends up looking something like this. And uh, this was an interesting experience for me because um, the people at Cloney Williamsburg, like I said, they're fanatic about bricks, and in particular, the bricks in the arch are what are called rub bricks. And back in the day, they would actually take bricks and rub them together manually <clears throat> to get them to be exactly the right size and shape so they could go together and have joints that were like a sixteenth of an inch to three thirty seconds. And, <clears throat> um, so they use machines now and saws to cut those, but it's still the same idea. So that's an example of um, using a mock-up to demonstrate that the contractors who are building a part of your building understand what it is they're supposed to do and can do it really well. And so it's very common in a construction project to have this be one of the requirements. And it's an opportunity for the architect and the owner to say, no, you've got it wrong. This is not acceptable. You have to do it again. It's, it's uh, a key part of the process. So then the last thing I'm going to talk about is a project that's nearing completion up in Worcester, Mass, for a place called the American Antiquarian Society. And this building on the right was first built in uh, 1912, so a little over 100 years ago. And then it was expanded to the left. Uh, it's a brick Georgian building. And it's an interesting place. It has a huge collection of everything that was printed in North America basically up until 1876 when the Library of Congress was enacted. They, they still collect everything before that, but they let the Library of Congress collect everything below after that. So the original building is the uh, cruciform element on the right with a long stack. Then the, that was 1912. Then the two other stacks were built mid-century. The last piece was built in 1990 and the top part in uh, 1970. And then this is the piece that we designed here as an expansion to the south. Uh, and then also we're renovating the entire mechanical system throughout the building. So in the basement level, this is uh, all new mechanical equipment to serve the stacks and the new building. And the main level is a public engagement space um, to sort of bring people from the community in to participate in what up until now has been a blank box. And the top floor is a conservation studio, so they have a place to take care of all this amazing collection. Then the section basically illustrates on the right, you can see how dense the stacks are. And on the left, every other floor is an occupiable floor with a skylight at the top. And students at Building Attack will appreciate the footings and the drainage pipes. <clears throat> so one, one way of looking at a mock-up is using other examples that other architects have used as um, an example of what could be possible. And in this particular case, for the addition, um, there was a long period where we debated with the client as to what would, uh, not just the shape of the, of the facade, but what would be on it. So first we talked about the precedent of libraries having the names of people who are collected within in the books. 
uh, both in Paris and in uh, Egypt. And uh, this is actually a winery, not a library. But we basically presented a bunch of examples of uh, using words as part of a facade and proposed um, using copper as a material and having the names of the luminaries of the collection. And at first they thought, oh, this is a great idea, we love it. But then there was a big controversy about the fact that uh, uh, President Wilson turned out to be a horrible racist and anti-Semite, and what if some one of the names we put here is somebody like that? So they didn't want to do that anymore. So, uh, but they were still into the idea of the copper and the idea of copper being a malleable uh, material. Uh, this is a picture of their founder, Isaiah Thomas, who was a printer and was a major printer during the revolution. And in fact, he learned to read as a little boy just by working at a print shop. Um, so, and they still have his original press. <clears throat> so we decided it would be interesting to look at um, having the facade evoking uh, that tradition of his having type like this and putting it into the facade. So if you look a little more closely, we had a sea of letters that were raised in reverse and then the name of the society uh, embossed as if, as if it had been imprinted. So taking the idea of the, the print and the <clears throat> printing. And for that we made some mock-ups of both the, the negative letters popping out and the recessed letters popping in. Uh, and examples both of unfinished copper and then copper that's been treated with acid so that it becomes patinated in advance. And then holding it up so people could see the scale um, from a distance, what it would look like. And um, they thought that was too busy, so we gave up on the idea of the font, but then said we still wanted an idea that had something to do with uh, the tradition of printing. So we found out that in the world of, uh, of printing, people always use this particular Latin quote as the example to compare fonts. So we thought, that's great, we'll, well, they'll pick the font that they want, and then we'll use that as part of the facade as well. Oopsie daisy, I'm backwards. I, what do I do with that? Um, okay. Um, so I can't get that to go back. So they said, come on, come on, come on, we're this institution that everybody thinks of as this black box and we're esoteric and we're weird. The last thing we want to do is to have a Latin quote on our facade. And the problem is I can't get it to move forward. Get to a normal screen and go escape. Go escape. She's going to go escape. It's doing a little here. If you go to PowerPoint, maybe you can get that. I think the computer is frozen. Right? If you exit. I'm trying. Yeah. Oh, I know what you have to do. You have to get out of it. <laughs> it's the spinning. Yeah, you, have to do, you have to, yes, I know, you have to get out of um, there, PowerPoint just, altogether. Where is that? Where is, uh, I want to get out of PowerPoint. You've got to get a close PowerPoint immediately. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No, you have to find the, uh, wh where's the icon of the PowerPoint? Yeah, under, right you, no, you, no, you've got to get out of there. You can't, if, if you bring that out, yeah, there. Now go to, go to PowerPoint and force quit. There it is. Now, you have to push option, option, yeah, four squares. Sorry about that. You're not there. Yeah, four squares, that's it, that's it. No, you don't have to start again. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Okay, I think we were here. Yeah, the one. There. 
So yeah, they said, this is way too esoteric. We can't deal with that. So finally, we just uh, went to their name and perforations. And they were happy with that. So we did mock-ups of perforations. And this was an interesting experience. They said, what about birds and wasps and bees? And we did, so I talked to an ornithologist and to an insect expert and discovered that bees would not build anything in such a narrow interstitial space. And wasps are highly territorial. So there'll be one wasp living in this facade. <laughs> and he won't let anybody else live there. Um, and then for the holes, we discovered that if seven eighths of an inch, we'll have lots of problems. Three quarters of an inch will be just fine. So uh, apparently, um, swallows and uh, uh, all kinds of birds could get in if it was seven eighths, but not three quarters. So then we had them build actual mock ups. Uh, and you can see this is even better than what we had done before. And that's what it looks like in the back. Then there's a mock-up in the shop to double check everything, make sure the kerning is correct. So again, this is a classic example of having them build it first, double check, make sure it's all okay, and patinating it. And that's patinating the perforated pieces. And then this is just last week. So one interesting thing that was, we knew that there would be some variation. And you can see there that there's, uh, there's a fair amount of variation in the facade from the patination process. But the guy was going to come back uh, in a couple weeks and do field adjustment to make it a little more even. And then over time, it'll become completely unified. So um, we want to end with a little movie here. So, so this is the guys installing it. And these basically are people who do a lot of rock climbing. They live up in Vermont, and they're really into this kind of thing. So if you look here, you'll see that um, they're using two by fours here as a very effective way of being able to hold things in place and be able to adjust it. And those little tags are the things that keep the reveals exactly the way they're supposed to be. And you can see that as they go through here, they're first double checking to make sure that everything is right and making little tweaks and adjustments, adding things, moving things around, making little tiny changes. I had to pull one out, put it back in, still double check. Tweaking, tweaking, make sure all those reveals are just right. We also originally designed the building to go from the bottom up and they convinced us it's good to do it from the top down. So then at this point now they're attaching and you can see they're working their way towards us with the drills screwing everything in, getting it all fixed. Take a coffee break. <laughs> Come back, finish up, start bringing out the next layer to go underneath. Another coffee break. that, I guess we're ready for your questions. So one thing I noticed through both presentations, Nadir, you mentioned that a drawing is constructive, that that shows it's, it has a demonstration of its buildability and it's kind of a connection from the drawing to the material world. And Sam Anderson, you demonstrated that through mock-ups and that are not necessarily full scale, but some in some cases they're full scale, kind of this making a promise towards buildability. And I'm wondering if buildability has a connection where how do you measure personally the success of a project? And this link between making a promise through drawing, constructing, constructing, building. I'm curious about that link. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, the drawing, uh, the drawing is a promise. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree totally with Nadir about the, uh, the, the notion that the drawing is um, evidence of how something can be made. Um, 
and it's a lot of times clients don't read drawings very well. I find even working with people in museums, a lot of times they won't understand the drawing. So uh, we usually try to show not just elevations and plans, but having a model or a, a visual representation three-dimensionally can be very helpful to make sure that they do understand what is it they're, they're getting. I mean, I think that um, the drawing and the building and the mock-up actually do different things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the context of the Western House, when I showed that animation of the of the undulating surface that is the result of a corrugated um, material, uh, I meant. It's, I, I was referring to its buildability in a very literal way. It's actually something that the material will allow and it's innate to it. But the effect that it produces is altogether something else. And that is what the role of the model was. Because that has to do with a kind of, you know, a, you know, let's say the play of light or the, you know, the, the, the kind of, phenomena that it produces. Uh, and I think if I were to go one more step from you know, that cardboard model to copper, if it had been copper, and you know, the question of whether it would have been natural copper or uh, oxidized copper or all of that, I think that's yet a third step, which uh, is, is another part of a construction process. So. Uh, all the while that I'm talking about the innate connection between drawing as a constructive act and, and building, there are other kinds of instrumentalities that come along the way, and each one of them is a design moment, or, 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 or a moment that where decisions diverge, actually. And, uh, and we've actually had the argument about uh, oxidizing copper or not oxidizing it, because also, if I'm not wrong, uh, if you let copper alone right now, it won't go green. Because there's not enough acid rain. Exactly, right. right. So, <laughs> so uh, and, then, and then how far you are, uh, oxidate it and, uh, or, or how you let it you know, go dark or purple is, is a different part of it. So I think these are also, like at every step, you're, you're forced into other kinds of instrumentalities. And I think the... The, the drawing to form one is just one of those moments. But I, I guess my gripe with representation has to do with uh, the, the knee-jerk uh, 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 polarity that brings everybody to make a picture of something as if the picture is the proof of something. And, and I, I like to think that there's other things that architecture produces and somehow it's it's those other disciplines that I like to invoke. So I have a question uh, to connect again uh, your part in academia with your office practices and it's this idea of I feel that in academia and in school there's a lot of inventiveness and inquiry and I wonder how if these ideas also impregnate your practices. Well, to the extent that we can, sure, yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, it's interesting. Some, some architects manage to start their practices in a way where they're being invented from the beginning, and other architects maybe don't pull that off quite as much. And once that happens, it's harder to make that happen again. So, uh, so I think it's, it's valuable advice as you're starting a practice, after you've, uh, you know, to to try to be as inventive and creative as you possibly can um, when you're starting. Um, and, and I found that you know, some clients are much more willing and open to engage in that kind of dialogue than others. Um, and I've tried to steer more and more in that direction. Um, and another way that I've done it, I'd say, is uh, hiring creative people and trying uh, one of the ways that I see a relationship between my practice and Cooper is, like Cooper's, uh, you know, rooms filled with very creative students, 
um, getting advice and suggestions from people. So I, to the extent that I can, I try to run my practice that way as well. So that the people in my firm are all in the position to be creative um, rather than a top-down kind of thing. I'm, here. I'm, I'm counting the projects I, I presented. I presented uh, six or seven projects and, and I'm not sure about the question of in, inventiveness. You're the one who, you're the critic. I can't, you can't sit on the stage and say, I'm the inventor. You have to say this is inventive work. I don't know. But I can tell you that the commitment is to a project. And the project is at once methodological, as well as drawing out certain sensibilities that are, either have to do with certain operations or, or radicalizing certain media. But I hadn't designed that, uh, this talk with that in mind, but I just realized that out of the six, seven projects, every single one of them has something to do with either a folded or undulating surface that does something uh, in the service of something else. Uh, the undulation of the corrugated uh, copper is in the service of a staircase that is allowed to enter from the garden to such and such. The folding of the wall at MIT has to do with the sun from 1 to 3 p.m. The uh, undulation of the roof in Daniels has to do with the span and, and the, you know, the other alibis that I entered into there. The uh, folding of the roof of the Adams Library has to do with the kind of singular surge of water, the hydrology towards uh, the back. Uh, all of them get couched into uh, you know, different uh, contingencies. But the project, you can't hide the fact that there's a project that underlies them. And that project is a kind of red thread that goes, well, in this case, from 20 years ago till today. Uh, and for me, I guess, uh, if there is a, a focus on the question of inventiveness, it's also a question about how you uh, define your research now or in the next five years and what's the lifespan of that research and does it have enough legs to uh, to to be imagined and cultivated through different scales different media and different vitalities so I I guess that what you're saying is that in every time you get a new project with a different client there's always like a your personal agenda and, and research interests trying, you know, speak in there behind all of it, trying to push. I, I think that's true for any architect, actually. I just think that possibly it's more vocal in, in some people's work than others in the sense that it's either much more clearly articulated and in others it's more of a kind of stealth background. Do you, oh, I'm sorry. Well, another way of answering the question is like an um, invention can be about uh, using material in a brand new way or coming up with an interesting shape or how things go together. But invention can also be just inventing a bunch of spaces that are new for people so that they can do what they need to do happily and well. Um, so in that respect, that's something that uh, we would always try to do. Try to invent, play, like when a client comes to you and says, this is my issue, this is my problem, this is what I need. To make sure that you're inventing the place for them to succeed with that. There's another dimension to your question which uh, interests me. That for the most part I think that architects transform, they don't invent. I think there are elements of the candela shell that are very inventive because they've never been done before. Uh, but 99% of what I showed you is about transformation. I think there's maybe only one inventive moment in there, and that has to do with the variable bond. Because that had not been articulated as such uh, ever before as a seamless tectonic. But the rest of it is always uses convention uh, in some way or another as a crutch to make it go the extra leap. So I mean, uh, if you're interested also in the the advent of invention, it's a very difficult thing to do 
Whereas architecture, no matter how you are working, invariably invokes and is in conversation with, um, you know, a world of current conventions out there, a history with, with certain consistencies and patterns, or certain canons against which it is revolting. Do you find that your expectations on how you approach a project in studio versus how you approach it in practice changes your own expectations? I'm not saying the project's expectations or the client's expectations. Uh, well, I mean, I, I try to approach students in the studio uh, open-mindedly, just like, what are you doing? What's, what are you trying to do here? And then to respond, uh, to say whether I think I see that they're arguing what they're talking about or not. Um, so that I, in that sense, I, my expectation is that they should be clear thinking and uh, precise in the way they talk about what they're doing. Um, but it's not like I want them to do a particular thing, necessarily, beyond being clear about what they're doing. I, 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 would, I would claim that the world that I build in the office and the world that I try to build in, in school are uh, very similar to a fault. Um, and maybe this is the reason why uh, I tend to fail in both arenas. Uh, I don't get what I want in school and I certainly don't get the kind of uh, presence in practice that I would prefer. But nonetheless, um, I also think that whatever you decide to do, this is one theory anyway, so take it or leave it. One theory is that you, you have to do what you have to do, and, and if it transports you to what the kinds of things that opportunities that come your way, all the better, and if they don't, Fuck it, just, you know, that's what, you, that's what you're interested in doing, and so do it. And, and so, to some degree, I'd rather not build more or not grow a large office. But if it means that it, it is able to expand on a certain territory that is of some kind of conceptual interest, uh, to, 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 that, to, that, to, the, to the extent that that is valuable, uh, I would also love to grow a school where uh, the student's research uh, becomes a, uh, a more present and visible aspect of their growth uh, during their five years. And I recognize when I say this that a lot of what we do are uh, in undergraduate programs are so foundational that to call it research is, is already a huge leap. But to the extent that you can build in your own trajectory a narrative that builds from last semester's project into some other thing, uh, I, I do see a, a huge value in that. To the extent also that we artificially try to do that in the construction of pedagogies. That, uh, Sometimes we try to build on the last semester, sometimes we try to uh, cut the umbilical cord and do something completely differently. But there is something to be achieved that can only be, be de described in temporal terms. Can I beg you to be inconsistent? <laughs> um, I think that the question which is a great question as well, the difference between <coughs> what one would do in the world of practice and what one does in the world of uh, education. I think that there is a very simple reason why they cannot be the same. The reason is that their goals are different. Uh, what there may be underlying the personal goals 
uh, from an architectural principle point of view of the architect in question. Uh, I think that while you're in school, the goal is a pedagogical one. It's for you to learn and understand things that you have not been, uh, have not had the experience of, that you don't have the knowledge of, and that you have to acquire that while you're at the same time producing something. Now what's similar is that you're producing something, but there's also a very curricular thing, which means that maybe the previous semester may not be of any use to you at that moment. What you need to do in the next one, because different people teach different ways, you know, the general curriculum, and there are many different approaches to that too. So there are, it's not a linear, consistent, uh, smooth progression uh, from one year to the next, from one semester to the next, etc. Et but overall, <coughs> a pedagogical strategies and principles have to do with education, with acquired knowledge through research, through making, through many different ways. Through testing, the drawing, and the model making, and the mock-up, and many other things. And the reading, and the writing, and the sketching, and the computer, and the hard line, etc., etc., etc. We may use all of that in practice, but practice has a lot of other constraints. And I don't think it's about the inventiveness. I think invention is overrated. Uh, it's a fashion, it's a mode of everybody's about invent inventiveness, inventing, inventing this, and inventing that. Very few things have been invented in the history of humanity. They happen every 500 years. You know, there's an invention or something like that. In architecture, certainly. You go by 500 years. So the question is that it's not about us, uh, Giancarlo Argan very clearly showed comparing Berlin and Borromini. Berlini seemed the one that was, you know, the big gestures, the big new thing, and so on. Borromini was tortured, you know, very different personality, tortured, so smaller gestures. But in the end, the one that made the big changes, architecturally speaking, was Borromini, in the end. So I think that there are different ways of contributing without being necessarily the invention. You know, it's the same thing as when people talk about original. The question is, what are the things you do? And when you're in practice, you have your own principles, you're an architect, and then you have clients, you have a budget, you have a particular, but you have to fight for those little words, I mean, you know, for those words and that. After all, the Vietnam Memorial has done that a long time ago with great success. So what were they questioning, right? I mean, there are plenty of examples of that historically. But you have to deal with all of the constraints and try to negotiate. You know, like trying to do a form that would, by formatting, would make to be concrete. But in the end, you do it with, you know, with studs and steel and wood and all that stuff, and then sheetrock and then acoustic, and then, and then it all looks kind of the same. Is it the same? Is it the same? Uh, that you have to question. Uh, I'm, I'm saying I, have, I have a response for you. Issue, no, but I'm saying about issues when you're an architect and you're actually making and probing and all that, you know, which is essential. And I think it's great that you manage to do it. But then it becomes a formal issue. If we did a form in relation to materiality, I think we're talking about those kinds of things here. So what I want to just to wrap it up in a second is that I think that they're both words connect. Architects have the old meat back here. But I don't think education should be imitating an office. Because you have the rest of your life for that. When you're in school, you have the opportunity to really, I don't know inventing, but put forth all your yet energy and creativity, whichever form that may take, without the kind of constraints that the real situation of an office would put upon you. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's something to cherish and to take advantage of. And I think that's a really important difference for me. I, I think your point is well taken, but it also merits uh, some clarification. 
First of all, it also depends on what hat we are wearing as we sit up here. In other words, the hat that I wear as an architect, which is what I'm trying to present here, is different than what I would say as a dean. In that sense, uh, I, I agree 100% with Diana in the sense that I think that um, the world of practice is so limiting and actually so pathetic often that it's not even worth pondering because what we can do in school uh, has so much more intellectual latitude in its capacity to transform practice in the future rather than submit yourself to it. So I do think that there is a necessary gap that we need to create in order that we have the space to become rather than the space to accommodate for the practice that is out there today. So we always like to say in these admissions events, we do not merely give the students skills because that would be a very uh, uh, myopic vision about what education can do, but rather to prepare them for all of the uncertainties out there in the world such that it's their mind, their intellect, and their ability to improvise under the direst of circumstances to be able to uh, insert design uh, as, a, a, as an instrumental function in society. The part that I said that, uh, about what I do to a fault is the fact that precisely because I treat my office so much as if it's a school studio scenario, uh, I, I actually cannot share that with a client. One, uh, because I generally don't like clients. They're, they're not productive. Very rarely are they a productive participant in, in the process. And that is not a, a blanket statement, it just is, you have to know <clears throat> when are they productive and to what extent. Two, I don't see the idea that we design and then build as a productive dichotomy. In our case, we build, therefore we design. And therefore, none of the experiments that you're seeing are the result of design thinking. Rather, they are, uh, there's a kind of interactive relationship between uh, conceptualizing building phenomena and representational phenomena in that moment, in that seed that you're planting out there. So let's say the uh, professional world does not tolerate that because they have a very well-structured notion of what happens in schematic design, design development, you know, CD, CA, and so forth and so on. Um, and then also, given the limits of my experience in professional offices, uh, I have been saved from professionalization. And so I see professionalization as a four-letter word because it uh, produces patterns of behavior and ambition which are woefully thin in terms of what I would want you to have. And so to some degree, while I think of everything in practice and in school as necessitating productive constraints. Uh, it is also important for you to know how you define those constraints to know what hurdles you're, you're crossing. So I'll, I'll beg to differ on, on one <laughs> element. <laughs> so in terms of the, I forget the exact word you use, but the relationship with the client. The ones I hate. Yes. Ones. So I, I mean, I endeavor to um, have clients that I can have happy, good relationships with. Um, so that, that leaves that most residential project. <laughs> Just because... You may need to say why. Yeah, so yeah, when you have people who want you to design a home for them, um, and it's an individual home as opposed to housing, uh, you inevitably get thrust into the position of being sort of a therapist, because they'll have disagreements and misunderstandings between each other that you have to reconcile. So. Uh, so I, I avoid those at almost all costs. Um, 
and, and I've been fortunate to have mostly uh, clients who are institutional people, people in museums or libraries. So when we're having meetings and talking about things, we're talking about their work. And it's just much easier for the people to make choices about their working life than it is to make about their personal life. Because a lot of times, though, if, again, the residential circumstance, people are talking about who they are and how they're representing themselves through their home. And if it's an individual house or home, they tend to be high income, and so they're very entitled. So it just this becomes problematic. In any case, um, uh, for me, having an interesting client is a wonderful thing. And I throw myself into learning who they are, what it is they do, why it's important to them, how it uh, reinforces, say, the mission of the museum or the library, so that I feel that what I'm doing uh, is serving a, a greater purpose. Um, and that uh, if they're if they're good clients, they will also be very stimulating and tend to challenge me in ways that will inevitably make the project better. It's, it's like in school. Can I ask you to yeah, sure. reframe what you're saying? Sure. Because it's too polite, but it also, it brushes everything under the carpet, the complexities. <laughs> and so, could you draw out the complexities that they bring and how they make it more interesting, because I could do the same. Okay. To say that, oh, I have great clients and I've learned so much from them and all of that, but I don't want to paint that pretty picture. I want to, I'd rather this forum become about how you unveil things that are not immediately visible to the eye. Sorry. That's okay. Um, well, uh, something I've noticed a lot lately is that in an early phase of design, when you're, you come up with an idea and you're presenting it, and you're with a bunch of people who, even if they're in an organization that's not their home, they still have different things going on, different ideas. And so they'll get into arguments or disagreements and just be confused. And what I find myself having to tell my staff, just let them be like this. Let, let them, we have to endure the process of their struggle to to figure out how do they articulate what they need and want, because they haven't figured it out. So you have to give a certain amount of time and energy, and you have to coax. You have to, <laughs> without saying, look, I've done this five times before, a hundred times before, this is the way you should do it. You have to give them suggestions so that they can see those and, and come to them. Um, is that closer? <laughs> well, well it, well, it is, because I'm looking at my screen and I'm, I'm saying, well, why is it that I hate these clients so much? So let's take a case study. MIT is not a client. It's 70 people represented by, you know, uh, 13 different inter interest groups. Working for MIT's uh, Office of the President has one interest. Uh, for the School of Architecture is a different one. For Mitimco, their real estate, real estate branch, is a different one. The forces of the city of Cambridge are another one. And then within the building, there's about 10 other constituencies that you have to serve right. in their programmatic needs, in their bureaucratic, bureaucratic needs. needs, and so forth. So a lot of, while the building is relatively benign in my, in my estimation and, and very contained in its expression, at the end, it's a, it, it's a manifestation of one's ability to bring consensus to a very complex situation which would otherwise not be possible. And often, and this is the difficult part, uh, because we don't live in the world of the 1940s and 50s, we cannot actually bring conceptual clarity to a project because involving uh, collaborations uh, across communities involves forces that A, contaminate the design process, B, uh, require actual inclusion. If you really want that, then you have to accept what they're bringing to the equation. And what you need to do is actually incorporate all of those ideas, but within an architectural strategy that yet may be the common denominator between their warring parties. To the extent that uh, one identifies in a client like this uh, hundreds of holes 
hundreds of inconsistencies, and even ethical doubts of your own, that I don't want to represent this client, and yet here I am, I've made a deal with the devil, and I'm doing it right now. One, by that time, by the time you know who they are, you're deep in the well, and you're having to make, in my mind, uh, some pretty difficult decisions about what constitutes integrity uh, in the context of the delivery of something that is at once uh, in any way a contribution to the discipline and second something that contributes to the well-being of a client in ways that they will never imagine because they don't obviously you don't talk about beauty to a client because that's just not part of the discussion you can't talk about pleasure because that's not that's not what they're asking for in a way, you know? Everything that you do is kind of a, anything that you do that's good is a surplus to the kinds of discussions you would be having with them. Well, I, I mean, I, there might be a scalar difference there. I mean, okay. The, I mean, it's like if you, for a big project for a big university and it's a big building, yeah. there are all these different entities that weigh in that, that have a finger in. Yes. So that's important. In a much smaller scale project, there aren't, there's still more than one or two, but it's, it's easier to talk about beauty in those circumstances. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Elizabeth? But, but you know, I actually think that that idea that you're having multiple conversations all the time in making a building is what makes being, a, being in practice and being a teacher at a school quite similar. You know, it's to say that it's not just one conversation all the time, like one conversation, and yet it is your voice all the time. So one's own agenda, I think, needs to be clear. Um, and that thread of how do you survive the onslaught in practice of multiple pressures, constant um, dissonance among, you know, clients and advisors and legal entities and zoning and community boards and all of that like being in school i think is about kind of practicing for practice it's practicing uh, understanding those multiple pressures and how your own agenda can establish a thread through them um, you know i think um, so much of hope, what I hope we do here for you is to not prepare you, you know, not to prepare you for practice through skills so much as prepare you by helping you to practice that process of going through a design project, of recognizing its multiple, um, its multiple questions, its multiple problematics, its multiple. Um, pressures and uh, agencies that you bring to it. And you do that 10 times in school. It's not a lot of times, but you do do it 10 times. And so it's to, um, it's to kind of build stamina, uh, intellectual stamina, creative stamina, uh, an understanding of your own practice, an understanding of your own um, desires and obsessions. Um, you know, and I think that's a similar thing to what we do in practice as one recognizes one's own continuing desires through a multiple range of projects. And you look for opportunities to uh, bring those questions to a project, some of which are articulated with the client, and some of which are articulated with your team, and some of them um, you just do. It's, you know, it's kind of about being prepared when an opportunity so, so let me ask you a question that I think you invoke, but maybe not. This could be for Sam, it could be for Ken or, or anybody else, but somehow those strategic choices that you're making constantly along the way, in my mind, must have something to do with architecture as a critical practice. Correct. In other words, yeah, exactly. that's, so that's the discipline. So. I'll give you that, you take it off.
they choose to be the they choose not to. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, I, I always had clients in California. But going uh, back to the question of what you experience and learn when you have a school, and in this particular school, or in this school in particular, is to see what you're doing the questions implies architecture. So we're always trying to, when we're dealing with exercises, when we're dealing with projects, we're always making them feel like we're always pushing for something of what it's meaning to play the architecture. So we're doing two things. We're always doing two things. So hopefully, what is the developed assignment based requirements and of course, there's something in what the assignment is already taken, right? In terms of this approach. But then I think one of the things that are important in trying to push here is for you to understand what it means in terms of critically. I think that is really not to take things for granted and not really the case of like just two days. What is it? What is it going to be? What are the things that are And some go the disciplinary aspect and they're going to keep on pursuing the schools and taking down the to the do. And others have to do with you as the humanist and intellectual that has chosen this discipline and in the last evidence. And you know, I try to make the most of it for the discussion, it's for the And I think we encourage everybody is to be on our courses to do that. I want to make a comment. I took her, uh, again, I have to think it was about the office. And one, one thing that you uh, all phrase and, and there is something that I noticed recently with students that I work with in this school, and it isn't just you as a show of it's your desire to have a dance of how to be a professional, how to be creative, how to be passionate, how to write motion, how to sing, how to write a book, uh, and so on. And, and I was reminded by my health of, of a set that stuck in my mind for a long time and that Grossi used to describe the work called Battle of Worlds in an essay that he wrote and characterized Lowe's work in terms of the novelty of the mode of intuition or perception. I don't want to have to figure out that. And, and that has to do with the novelty comes out from an intellectual knowledge, an intellectual work, an exploration that is able to reframe what you're looking at uh, in a different way. And, and that also, uh, and I defend something that I think is important that we understand in school, it has to do with the fact that in the history of architecture, among the most influential in terms of exactly or changing the perspective of students are seeing are drawings, uh, more than buildings. And even if there are buildings, there are the drawings of the buildings that are more important to transmit the, the, the kind of novelty of the modern intuition, the change, uh, the paradigm, if you want. So, so I, I think that you have to, in a way, do a lot of soul searching rather than question you have to be creative. Creative doesn't happen in just the way that's important. And I would say today, I'm going to advance something. Uh, it happens because what you are tackling is this constant question, possibly reconsider, possibly different, after the point in which you are developing a different kind of thing. And this one has certainly an effect for our practice. And I just do that and I don't know, five hundred years, but maybe more. But it's also very important because that central phase of your war is the fundamental a threat that, that you have to engage all these difficult kinds of things. Uh, if you don't have a strong uh, uh, position, strong argument, you 
the way in relation to what you are searching for. Yeah, yeah. 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 The question is the ovulation is something that is engaging uh, in this work or in this intellectual search all the time. Then, then you are going to have to fight against class. The class is going to tell you what to do. Unless you have a way to frame what you're doing, that is able to absorb, to absorb it, to evolve it, you can work with class, to absorb all the different agencies that are part of the world, which is the intellectual search. Very, very 
very small lens like that. But insofar as anyone might be invested in the same way that I am to architecture as a building practice of things, objects, buildings, spaces, landscapes, the only thing I would like to bring to that discussion is that after you solve all of its problems, after you uh, satisfy all of the client's requests, after you've been responsible as an architect, there's still no guarantee it's a piece of architecture because that architecture is something else as a surplus, as something that transcends the terms of the requests that are on the table. And to the extent that you're invested in any form of research or inquiry, uh, it's that stuff that you're able to somehow qualify after you've departed and gone away from the work. Because somehow you see what resonates, whether it's in the public imaginary or whether it's in the way that a space becomes used in ways you've never imagined. I think those are important things to, to, to think about. And we don't understand it has to be hard. That really is just a miracle. A new Perhaps what that you see, you may do it a lot.
things are great here. Meeting. But he had a lot of things to experience and you to formulate some of that. So, I'm not using that. The one thing that Fergus does, in many ways more explicitly than some of the others, which makes it more difficult to discuss, is that it, it poses certain questions that invite you to tell a story about them, which is the other thing that you do all the time, which is nothing to do with it. A lot of what our history is just raw. The other thing we do is tell stories. Sometimes they have some truth in them. Sometimes there's a logic, a lot of imagination for which there's no substance. But they're, they're not verifiable, but they're consistent as narrative. And uh, what I continue to love about um, the analysis studio is the ability to tell a story that even the architect who conceived of that building uh, did not tell or could not have told in the way that he was told. And, uh, and that's actually one of the reasons I, I did the tech get to and that's one of the reasons I just read it explicitly for you because in, in telling the story, you're not only telling your story, but you're embedding that story in narratives written by other people in other histories at other moments in time, and you're patching together fragments of others' visions, never uh, holistically put together in this way. Uh, so I, I do think that there's something about, um, see, I don't know what, you know, if you want a linear connection, a causal relationship between education and practice, and this is a weak explanation. But in the broader sense, what we do out there in the world is tell stories. And when we're convincing, which we can make is tell anything. And it's frightening, actually, because some people tell stories better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> 